Section 13 of Great Pirate Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee. Great Pirate Stories by Various. Edited by Joseph Louis French. Section 13. Francis Lolonois, the slave who became a pirate king. John Esquemeling. Francis Lolonois was a native of that territory in France, which is called Les Sables d'Olon, or the Sands of Olon. In his youth he was transported to the Caribbee Islands in quality of servant or slave, according to custom, Having served his time, he came to Hispaniola. Here he joined for some time with the hunters, before he began his robberies upon the Spaniards. At first he made two or three voyages as a common mariner, wherein he behaved himself so courageously as to gain the favor of the governor of Tortuga, Monsieur de la Place, insomuch that he gave him a ship in which he might seek his fortune, which was very favorable to him at first, for in a short time he got great riches. But his cruelties against the Spaniards were such that the fame of them made him so well known through the Indies that the Spaniards in his time would choose rather to die or sink fighting than surrender, knowing they should have no mercy at his hands. But fortune, being seldom constant, after some time turned her back. For in a huge storm he lost his ship on the coast of Campeche. The men were all saved, but coming upon dry land, the Spaniards pursued them and killed the greatest part, wounding also Lolonois. Not knowing how to escape, he saved his life by a stratagem, mingling sand with the blood of his wounds, with which, besmearing his face and other parts of his body, and hiding himself dexterously among the dead, he continued there till the Spaniards quitted the field. They being gone, he retired to the woods and bound up his wounds as well as he could. These being pretty well healed, he took his way to Campeche, having disguised himself in a Spanish habit. Here he enticed certain slaves to whom he promised liberty if they would obey him and trust to his conduct. They accepted his promises and, stealing a canoe, they went to sea with him. Now the Spaniards, having made several of his companions prisoners, kept them close in a dungeon, while Lolonois went about the town and saw what passed. These were often asked, What has become of your captain? To whom they constantly answered, He is dead, which rejoiced the Spaniards, who made thanks to God for their deliverance from such a cruel pirate. Lolonois, having seen these rejoicings for his death, made haste to escape with the slaves above mentioned, and came safe to Tortuga, the common refuge of all sorts of wickedness, and the seminary, as it were, of pirates and thieves. Though now his fortune was low, yet he got another ship with craft and subtlety, and in it twenty-one men. Being well provided with arms and necessaries, he set forth for Cuba, on the south whereof is a small village called De Los Cayos. The inhabitants drive a great trade in tobacco, sugar, and hides, and all in boats, not being able to use ships by reason of the little depth of that sea. Lolonois was persuaded he should get here some considerable prey, but by the good fortune of some fishermen who saw him, and the mercy of God, they escaped him. For the inhabitants of the town dispatched immediately a vessel overland to the Havana, complaining that Lolonois was come to destroy them with two canoes. The governor could hardly believe this, having received letters from Campeche that he was dead. But at their importunity, he sent a ship for their relief with ten guns and ninety men well armed giving them this express command, that they should not return into his presence without having totally destroyed those pirates. 
To this effect he gave them a negro to serve for a hangman, and orders that they should immediately hang every one of the pirates, excepting Lolonois, their captain, whom they should bring alive to the Havana. The ship arrived at Gaios, of whose coming the pirates were advertised beforehand, and instead of flying, they went to seek it in the river Estera, where she rode at anchor. The pirates seized some fishermen and forced them by night to show them the entry of the port, hoping soon to obtain a greater vessel than their two canoes, and thereby to mend their fortune. They arrived after two in the morning, very nigh the ship, and the watch on board the ship asking them whence they came, and if they had seen any pirates abroad. They caused one of the prisoners to answer. They had seen no pirates, nor anything else, which answer made them believe that they were fled upon hearing of their coming. But they soon found the contrary, for about break of day the pirates assaulted the vessel on both sides with their two canoes with such vigor that though the Spaniards behaved themselves as they ought and made as good defense as they could, making some use of their great guns, yet they were forced to surrender, being beaten by the pirates with sword in hand down under the hatches. From hence Lolonois commanded them to be brought up, one by one, and in this order caused their heads to be struck off. Among the rest came up the negro, designed to be the pirate's executioner. This fellow implored mercy at his hands, very dolefully, telling Lolonois he was constituted hangman of that ship, and if he would spare him, he would tell him faithfully all that he should desire. Lolonois, making him confess what he thought fit, commanded him to be murdered with the rest. Thus he cruelly and barbarously put them all to death, reserving only one alive, whom he sent back to the governor of the Havana with this message in writing, I shall never henceforward give quarter to any Spaniard whatsoever, and I have great hopes I shall execute on your own person the very same punishment I have done upon them you sent against me. Thus I have retaliated the kindness you designed to me and my companions. The governor, much troubled at this bad news, swore in the presence of many that he would never grant quarter to any pirate that should fall into his hands. But the citizens of the Havana desired him not to persist in the execution of that rash and rigorous oath, seeing the pirates would certainly take occasion from thence to do the same, and they had an hundred times more opportunity of revenge than he, that being necessitated to get their livelihood by fishery. They should hereafter always be in danger of their lives. By these reasons, he was persuaded to bridle his anger and remit the severity of his oath. Now Lolonois had got a good ship, but very few provisions and people in it, to purchase both which he resolved to cruise from one port to another. Doing thus for some time without success, he determined to go to the port of Maracaibo. Here he surprised a ship laden with plate and other merchandises outward bound to buy cocoa nuts. With this prize he returned to Tortuga, where he was received with joy by the inhabitants, they congratulating his happy success and their own private interests. He stayed not long there, but designed to equip a fleet sufficient to transport five hundred men and necessaries. Thus provided, he resolved to pillage both cities, towns, and villages, and finally to take Maracaibo itself. For this purpose he knew the island of Tortuga would afford him many resolute and courageous men fit for such enterprises. Besides, he had in his service several prisoners well acquainted with the ways and places designed upon. Of this design, 
Lolonois giving notice to all the pirates, whether at home or abroad, he got together. In a little while, above four hundred men, beside which there was then in Tortuga another pirate named Michael de Basco, who, by his piracy, had got riches sufficient to live at ease and go no more abroad, having, withal, the office of major of the island. But seeing the great preparations that Lolonois made for this expedition, he joined him, and offered him that if he would make him his chief captain by land, seeing he knew the country very well and all its avenues, he would share in his fortunes and go with him. They agreed upon articles to the great joy of Lolonois, knowing that Basco had done great actions in Europe and had the repute of a good soldier. Thus they all embarked in eight vessels, that of Lolonois being the greatest, having ten guns of indifferent carriage. All things being ready, and the whole company on board, they set sail together about the end of April, being in all six hundred and sixty persons. They steered for that part called Bayala, north of Hispaniola. Here they took into their company some French hunters, who voluntarily offered themselves, and here they provided themselves with victuals and necessaries for their voyage. From hence they sailed again the last of July, and steered directly to the eastern cape of the isle called Punta de Espada. Hereabouts, espying a ship from Puerto Rico, bound for New Spain, laden with cocoa nuts, Lolonois, commanded the rest of the fleet to wait for him near Savona, on the east of Cape Punta de Espada, he alone intending to take the said vessel. The Spaniards, though, they had been in sight full two hours, and knew them to be pirates, yet would not flee, but prepared to fight, being well armed and provided. The combat lasted three hours, and then they surrendered, the ship had sixteen guns and fifty fighting men aboard. They found in her one hundred and twenty thousand weight of cocoa, forty thousand pieces of eight, and the value of ten thousand more in jewels. Lolonois sent the vessel presently to Tortuga to be unladed, with orders to return as soon as possible to Savona, where he would wait for them. Meanwhile, the rest of the fleet, being arrived at Savona, met another Spanish vessel coming from Coman, with military provisions to Hispaniola and money to pay the garrisons there. This vessel they also took, without any resistance, though mounted with eight guns. In it were seven thousand weight of powder, a great number of muskets, and like things, with twelve thousand pieces of eight. These successes encouraged the pirates, they seeming very lucky beginnings, especially finding their fleet pretty well recruited in a little time for the first ship arriving at Tortuga. The governor ordered it to be instantly unladen and soon after sent back with fresh provisions and other necessaries to Lolonois. This ship he chose for himself and gave that which he commanded to his comrade, Anthony Dupuy. Being thus recruited with men in lieu of them he had lost in taking the prizes, and by sickness he found himself in a good condition to set sail for Maracaibo, in the province of Nueva Venezuela, in the latitude of twelve degrees ten minutes north. This island is twenty leagues long and twelve broad. To this port also belong the islands of Onega and Monges. The east side thereof is called Cape St. Roman, and the western side Cape of Cacibacoa. The gulf is called, by some, the Gulf of Venezuela, but the pirates usually call it the Bay of Maracaibo. At the entrance of this gulf are two islands extending from east to west. That towards the east is called Isla de la Vigilias, or the Watch Isle, because in the middle is a high hill on which stands a watch house. 
The other is called Isla de la Palomas, or the Isle of Pigeons. Between these two islands runs a little sea, or rather lake of fresh water, sixty leagues long and thirty broad, which, disgorging itself into the ocean, dilates itself about the said two islands. Between them is the best passage for ships, the channel being no broader than the flight of a great gun, of about eight pounds. On the Isle of Pigeons standeth a castle, to impede the entry of vessels, all being necessitated to come very nigh the castle by reason of two banks of sand on the other side with only fourteen feet water. Many other banks of sand there are in this lake, as that called El Tablazo, or the Great Table, no deeper than ten feet, forty leagues within the lake. Others there are that have no more than six, seven, or eight feet in depth. All are very dangerous, especially to mariners unacquainted with them. West hereof is the city of Maracaibo, very pleasant to the view, its houses being built along the shore, having delightful prospects all round. The city may contain three or four thousand persons, slaves included, all which make a town of reasonable bigness. There are judged to be about eight hundred persons able to bear arms, all Spaniards. Here are one parish church, well built and adorned, four monasteries, and one hospital. The city is governed by a deputy governor, substituted by the governor of the Caracas. The trade here exercised is mostly in hides and tobacco. The inhabitants possess great numbers of cattle, and many plantations, which extend thirty leagues in the country especially towards the great town of Gibraltar, where are gathered great quantities of cocoa nuts and all other garden fruits, which serve for the regal and sustenance of the inhabitants of Maracaibo, whose territories are much drier than those of Gibraltar. Hither those of Maracaibo send great quantities of flesh, they making returns in oranges, lemons, and other fruits, for the inhabitants of Gibraltar want flesh, their fields not being capable of feeding cows or sheep. Before Maracaibo is a very spacious and secure port, wherein may be built all sorts of vessels, having great convenience of timber, which may be transported thither at little charge. Nigh the town lies also a small island called Borica where they feed great numbers of goats, which cattle the inhabitants use more for their skins than their flesh or milk, they sliding these two, unless while they are tender and young kids. In the fields are fed some sheep, but of a very small size. In some islands of the lake, and in other places hereabouts, are many savage Indians, called by the Spaniards bravos, or wild. These could never be reduced by the Spaniards, being brutish and untamable. They dwell mostly towards the west side of the lake, in little huts built on trees growing in the water, so to keep themselves from innumerable mosquitoes or gnats, which infest and torment them night and day. To the east of the said lake are whole towns of fishermen, who likewise live in huts built on trees, as the former. Another reason of this dwelling is the frequent inundations, for after great rains the land is often overflown for two or three leagues, there being no less than twenty-five great rivers that feed this lake. The town of Gibraltar is also frequently drowned by these, so that the inhabitants are constrained to retire to their plantations. Gibraltar situate at the side of the lake, about forty leagues within it, receives its provisions of flesh, as has been said, from Maracaibo. The town is inhabited by about fifteen hundred persons, whereof four hundred may bear arms. The greatest part of them keep shops, wherein they exercise one trade or another, 
In the adjacent fields are numerous plantations of sugar and cocoa, in which are many tall and beautiful trees, of whose timber houses may be built and ships. Among these are many handsome and proportionable cedars, seven or eight feet about, of which they can build boats and ships, so as to bear only one great sail, such vessels being called piraguas. The whole country is well furnished with rivers and brooks, very useful in droughts, being then cut into many little channels to water their fields and plantations. They plant also much tobacco, well esteemed in Europe, and for its goodness is called their tobacco de sacerdotes, or priest tobacco. They enjoy nigh twenty leagues of jurisdiction, which is bounded by very high mountains, perpetually covered with snow. On the other side of these mountains is situate a great city called Merida, to which the town of Gibraltar is subject. All merchandise is carried hence to the aforesaid city on mules, and that but at one season of the year, by reason of the excessive cold in those high mountains. On the said mules returns are made in flour of meal, which comes from towards Peru, by the way of Estafe. Lolonois, arriving at the Gulf of Venezuela, cast anchor with his whole fleet out of sight of the Vigilia, or Watch Isle. Next day, very early, he set sail thence with all his ships for the lake of Maracaibo, where they cast anchor again. Then they landed their men with design to attack first the fortress that commanded the bar, therefore called De La Barra. This fort consisted only of several great baskets of earth placed on a rising ground, planted with sixteen great guns, with several other heaps of earth round about for covering their men. The pirates having landed a league off this fort, advanced by degrees toward it, but the governor, having espied their landing, had placed an ambuscade to cut them off behind while he should attack them in front. This the pirates discovered, and getting before, they defeated it so entirely that not a man could retreat to the castle. This done, Lolonois, with his companions, advanced immediately to the fort, and after a fight of almost three hours, with the usual desperation of this sort of people, they became masters thereof, without any other arms than swords and pistols, while they were fighting. Those who were the routed ambuscade, not being able to get into the castle, retired into Maracaibo in great confusion and disorder, crying, The pirates will presently be here with two thousand men and more. The city having formerly been taken by this kind of people, and sacked to the uttermost, had still an idea of that misery so that upon these dismal news they endeavored to escape towards Gibraltar in their boats and canoes, carrying with them all the goods and money they could. Being come to Gibraltar, they told how the fortress was taken, and nothing had been saved, nor any persons escaped. The castle thus taken by the pirates, they presently signified to the ships their victory, that they should come farther in without fear of danger. The rest of that day was spent in ruining and demolishing the said castle. They nailed the guns and burnt as much as they could not carried away, burying the dead and sending on board the fleet the wounded. Next day, very early, they weighed anchor and steered directly towards Maracaibo, about six leagues distant from the fort. But the wind failing that day, they could advance little, being forced to await the tide. Next morning, they came in sight of the town and prepared for landing under the protection of their own guns, fearing the Spaniards might have laid an ambuscade in the woods. They put their men into canoes, brought for that purpose, and landed, shooting meanwhile furiously with their great guns. Of those in the canoes, half only went ashore. The other half remained aboard. They fired from the ships as fast as possible towards the woody part of the shore, but could discover nobody. Then they entered the town, whose inhabitants were retired to the woods, and Gibraltar with their wives, children, and families. Their houses they left well provided with victuals, as flour, bread, pork, brandy, wines, and poultry, and with these the pirates fell to making good cheer, for in four weeks before they had no opportunity 
of filling their stomachs with such plenty. They instantly possessed themselves of the best houses in the town, and placed sentinels wherever they thought necessary. The great church served them for their main guard. Next day they sent out a hundred and sixty men to find out some of the inhabitants in the woods thereabouts. These returned the same night, bringing with them twenty thousand pieces of eight, several mules laden with household goods and merchandise, and twenty prisoners, men, women, and children. Some of these were put to the rack to make them confess where they had hid the rest of the goods, but they could extort very little from them. Lolonois, who valued not murdering, though in cold blood, ten or twelve Spaniards, drew his cutlass and hacked one to pieces before the rest, saying, If you do not confess and declare where you have hid the rest of your goods, I will do the like to all your companions. At last, among these horrible cruelties and inhuman threats, one promised to show the place where the rest of the Spaniards were hid, but those that were fled, having intelligence of it, changed place and buried the remnant of their riches underground so that the pirates could not find them out, unless some of their own party should reveal them. Besides, the Spaniards flying from one place to another every day, and often changing woods, were jealous even of each other, so that the father durst scarce trust his own son. After the pirates had been fifteen days in Maracaibo, they resolved for Gibraltar, but the inhabitants, having received intelligence thereof, and that they intended afterwards to go to Merida, gave notice of it to the governor there, who was a valiant soldier, and had been an officer in Flanders. His answer was, he would have them take no care, for he hoped in a little while to exterminate the said pirates. Whereupon he came to Gibraltar with four hundred men, well armed, ordering at the same time the inhabitants to put themselves in arms, so that in all he made eight hundred fighting men. With the same speed he raised a battery toward the sea, mounted with twenty guns, covered with great baskets of earth. Another battery he placed in another place, mounted with eight guns. This done, he barricaded a narrow passage to the town, through which the pirates must pass, opening at the same time another one, threw much dirt and mud into a wood which was totally unknown to the pirates. The pirates, ignorant of these preparations, having embarked all their prisoners and booty, took their way towards Gibraltar. Being come in sight of the place, they saw the royal standard hanging forth, and that those of the town designed to defend their homes. Lolonois, seeing this, called a council of war, what they ought to do, telling his officers and mariners that the difficulty of the enterprise was very great, seeing the Spaniards had had so much time to put themselves in a posture of defense, and had got a good body of men together with much ammunition. But notwithstanding, said he, have a good courage. We must either defend ourselves like good soldiers, or lose our lives with all the riches we have got. Do as I shall do, who am your captain. At other times we have fought with fewer men than we have in our company at present, and yet we have overcome greater numbers than there possibly can be in this town. The more they are, the more glory and the greater riches we shall gain. The pirates supposed that all the riches of the inhabitants of Maracaibo were transported to Gibraltar, or at least the greatest part. After this speech they all promised to follow and obey him. Lolonois made answer, "'Tis well, but know ye, withal, that the first man who shall show any fear, or the least apprehension thereof, I will pistol him with my own hands. With this resolution they cast anchor nigh the shore, near three quarters of a league from the town. Next day, before sunrising, they landed three hundred and eighty men well provided, and armed every one with a cutlass and one or two pistols, and sufficient powder and bullet for thirty charges. Here they all shook hands in testimony of good courage, and began their march, Lolonois speaking thus, Come, my brethren, follow me, and have good courage. They followed their guide, who, believing he led them well, brought them to the way which the governor had barricaded. Not being able to pass that way, they went to the other newly made in the wood among the mire, 
which the Spaniards could shoot into at pleasure. But the pirates, full of courage, cut down the branches of trees and threw them on the way, that they might not stick in the dirt. Meanwhile those of Gibraltar fired with their great guns so furiously they could scarce hear nor see for the noise and smoke. Being past the wood, they came on firm ground, where they met with a battery of six guns, which immediately the Spaniards discharged upon them, all loaded with small bullets and pieces of iron, and the Spaniards, sallying forth, set upon them with such fury as caused the pirates to give way, few of them caring to advance towards the fort, many of them being already killed and wounded. This made them go back to seek another way, but the Spaniards, having cut down many trees to hinder the passage, they could find none, but were forced to return to that they had left. Here the Spaniards continued to fire as before, nor would they sally out of their batteries to attack them any more. Lolonois and his companions, not being able to climb up the bastion of earth, were compelled to use an old stratagem, wherewith at last they deceived and overcame the Spaniards. Lolonois retired suddenly with all his men, making show as if he fled. Hereupon the Spaniards, crying out, They flee! They flee! Let us follow them! sallied forth with great disorder to the pursuit, being drawn to some distance from the batteries, which was the pirates' only design, they turned upon them unexpectedly with sword in hand, and killed above two hundred men, and thus, fighting their way through those who remained, they possessed themselves of the batteries. The Spaniards that remained abroad, giving themselves over for loss, fled to the woods. Those in the battery of eight guns surrendered themselves, obtaining quarter for their lives. The pirates, being now become masters of the town, pulled down the Spanish colors, and set up their own, taking prisoners as many as they could find. These they carried to the great church, where they raised a battery of several great guns, fearing lest the Spaniards that were fled should rally, and come upon them again. But next day, being all fortified, their fears were over. They gathered the dead to bury them, being above five hundred Spaniards, besides the wooded in the town, and those that died of their wounds in the woods. The pirates had also above one hundred and fifty prisoners, and nigh five hundred slaves, many women and children. Of their own companions only forty were killed, and almost eighty wounded, whereof the greatest part died through the bad air, which brought fevers and other illness. They put the slain Spaniards into two great boats, and carrying them a quarter of a league to sea, they sunk the boats. This done, they gathered all the plate, household stuff, and merchandise they could, or thought convenient to carry away. The Spaniards, who had anything left, had hid it carefully, but the unsatisfied pirates, not contented with the riches they had got, sought for more goods and merchandise, not sparing those who lived in the fields, such as hunters and planters. They had scarce been eighteen days on the place, when the greatest part of the prisoners died for hunger. For in the town were few provisions, especially of flesh, though they had some, but no sufficient quantity of flour of meal, and this the pirates had taken for themselves, as they also took the swine, cows, sheep, and poultry, without allowing any share to the poor prisoners. For these they only provided some small quantity of mules and asses' flesh, and many who could not eat of that loathsome provision died for hunger, their stomachs not being accustomed to such sustenance. Of the prisoners many also died under the torment they sustained, to make them discover their money or jewels, and of these some had none, nor knew of none, and others, denying what they knew, endured such horrible deaths. Finally, after having been in possession of the town four entire weeks, they sent four of the prisoners to the Spaniards that were fled to the woods, demanding of them a ransom for not burning the town. The sum demanded was ten thousand pieces of eight, which, if not sent, they threatened to reduce it to ashes. For bringing in this money they allowed them only two days, but the Spaniards, not having been able to gather so punctually such a sum, 
the pirates fired many parts of the town, whereupon the inhabitants begged them to help quench the fire, and the ransom should be readily paid. The pirates condescended, helping as much as they could to stop the fire, but, notwithstanding all their best endeavors, one part of the town was ruined, especially the church belonging to the monastery was burned down. After they had received the said sum, they carried aboard all the riches they had got, with a great number of slaves which had not paid the ransom, for all the prisoners had sums of money set upon them, and the slaves were also commanded to be redeemed. Thence they returned to Maracaibo, where being arrived they found a general consternation in the whole city, to which they sent three or four prisoners to tell the governor and inhabitants. They should bring thirty thousand pieces of eight aboard their ships for a ransom of their houses, otherwise they should be sacked anew and burned. Among these debates a party of pirates came on shore and carried away the images, pictures, and bells of the great church aboard the fleet. The Spaniards who were sent to demand the sum aforesaid returned with orders to make some agreement, who concluded with the pirates to give for their ransom and liberty twenty thousand pieces of eight and five hundred cows, provided that they should commit no further hostilities, but depart thence presently after payment of money and cattle. The one and the other being delivered, the whole fleet set sail, causing great joy to the inhabitants of Maracaibo to see themselves quit of them. But three days after they renewed their fears with admiration, seeing the pirates appear again and re-enter the port with all their ships, but these apprehensions vanished upon hearing one of the pirates errand, who come ashore from Lolonois to demand a skillful pilot to conduct one of the greatest ships over the dangerous bank that lieth at the very entry of the lake, which petition, or rather command, was instantly granted. They had now been full two months in these towns, wherein they committed those cruel and insolent actions we have related. Departing thence, they took their course to Hispaniola, and arrived there in eight days, casting anchor in a port called Isla de la Vaca, or Cow Island. This island is inhabited by French buccaneers who mostly sell the flesh they hunt to pirates and others, who now and then put in there to victual or trade. Here they unladed their whole cargazon of riches, the usual storehouse of the pirates being commonly under the shelter of the buccaneers. Here they made a dividend of all their prizes and gains according to the orders and degree of every one, as has been mentioned before. Having made an exact calculation of all their plunder, they found in ready money 260,000 pieces of eight. This being divided, every one received for his share in money, as also in silk, linen, and other commodities, to the value of 100 pieces of eight. Those who had been wounded received their first part, after the rate mentioned before, for the loss of their limbs, then they weighed all the plate uncoined, reckoning ten pieces of eight to a pound. The jewels were prized indifferently, either too high or too low, by reason of their ignorance. This done, every one was put to his oath again, that he had not smuggled anything from the common stock. Hence they proceeded to the dividend of the shares of such as were dead in battle, or otherwise these shares were given to their friends to be kept entire for them, and to be delivered in due time to their nearest relations or their apparent lawful heirs. The whole dividend being finished, they set sail for Tortuga. Here they arrived a month after, to the great joy of most of the island, for as to the common pirates, in three weeks they had scarce any money left, having spent it all in things of little value, or lost it at play. Here had arrived, not long before them, two French ships, with wine and brandy and such like commodities, whereby these liquors, at the arrival of the pirates, were indifferent cheap. But this lasted not long, for soon after they were enhanced extremely, a gallon of brandy being sold for four pieces of eight. The governor of the island bought of the pirates the whole cargo of the ship, laden with cocoa, 
giving for that rich commodity scarce the twentieth part of its worth. Thus they made shift to lose and spend the riches they had got in much less time than they were obtained. The taverns and stews, according to the custom of pirates, got the greatest part, so that soon after they were forced to seek more by the same unlawful means they had got the former. End of chapter 13 Francis Lolonois, the slave who became a pirate king Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago gis.depaul.edu slash pmcafee